So I'm not sure exactly how popular the Devil Came Through Here series is. At least among the people I know, everyone played or seen a let's play of the Cat Lady at the very least. And while it is an amazing game, we're here to talk about its successor today, Downfall. Judging by the Steam reviews, there's a chance you didn't even know that The Cat Lady is the first game in a trilogy. So I highly recommend checking both Downfall and Lorelei out. This video will be understandable for people who haven't played it, but it's always better to know what I'm talking about. And also, these games are amazing, please do check them out. By the way, I won't be discussing Downfall 2009 in this video because, I mean, it is an interesting game, I guess, but I don't think it has anything to do with the Devil Came Through Here trilogy. <laughs> My last by the way in the beginning of this video is to please go check out Burnhouse Lane, it's the developer's newest game and let support into developers and it's so 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 beautiful i loved it a lot so let's go through downfall redux and the secret hiding in plain sight the game starts with the prologue which is set when the characters were all kids the main character, Joe, is talking to his brother, Robbie. Robbie heard someone he thinks is a gangster talk about something hidden in the construction site nearby, and he's gonna go look for it. Joe says, Yeah, right. Good luck with that. And they go their separate ways. Soon, Joe sees a girl sitting in front of a diner and they start talking. Her name is Ivy, she's from Sweden, she likes cats and red flowers, she's on a diet and hates her dad who left them. Joe tells her that he knows the place where cats go to die and that there are a bunch of red flowers nearby and he takes her to see them. After that, they see an ice cream truck and run after it. Joe orders his ice cream and asks Ivy what does she want. She tells him that she doesn't want anything, but he insists, and she blows up on him. I said no, and no means no. You should probably go after her, dude. They quickly make up as all kids do, and then Robbie shows up, saying that he found the money and needs Joe's help. They all go to the construction site and Joe pries a concrete slab open, but it's not money they find in there. Oh, shit. What is it? Step away, both of you. It's grenades. A great bowl of freaking grenades. Ivy and Joe back off to go call the police, but Robbie stays back. He says that it's not money, but the grenades must be worth something, right? He could sell them. He picks one up, and then... Do you think we can... Yeah. Then it cuts to grown-up Joe's voiceover. He says that they met again when they were in their 20s. He doesn't think Ivy remembered him, or at least she didn't mention anything, and neither did he. 
Him and Ivy fell in love and got married within a few months. But then... Then our luck ran out and the cracks started to show. But I knew how to fix it. His solution is a quick holiday, but things aren't great because as soon as they get there, she starts giving him the silent treatment. He follows her to the dining room and... Rats stay away from this devil, Joe. You'd know this much if you'd paid attention, dear. When was the last time you looked really close in the mirror and heard hello? Why? What? The parasites that set their roots deep down under our skin. The big fat flesh-eating maggots with blood pouring out of their hungry mouth. Ivy clearly needs serious help and Joe isn't really giving it. They get a room and continue arguing and Ivy tells him I think it's time to say it loud and clear. Ivy. I'm serious. This stupid holiday, it's never gonna fix anything. It's too late for that. So please, say it, Joe. Say it. So we can both be free. I still love you. No, that's the thing you don't. You have to understand that, Joe. Whatever that was between us. It's gone. Ivy leaves and Joe falls asleep. Trippy dreams ensues, but was it really a dream? Joe still has the 10 pound bill he picked up in it. This game merges dream and reality all the time, so I won't be mentioning it anymore. Joe tries to find Ivy, but when he walks into the dining room to see if she's having breakfast, he finds this. Apparently, Ivy's with Sophie, the person staying in the room next to theirs, and she doesn't want Joe to look for her. The manageress leaves a key for room 102 on the front desk for Joe anyway. After some puzzle solving, he gets the key, but before going to Sophie, there's a torn up letter written by Ivy in the room. I miss you. You know. We were good together. Always there. When I was falling. And bad felt better. Every time. With you. Joe finally confronts Sophie and she says that Ivy's hiding behind a mirror and that he has to kill four memories of Sophie and that she herself is the first one. Only then he'll be able to reach Ivy. After that, the elevator starts working again. On the second floor, whispers can be heard next to a window in this corridor. And then... Mother is crying. <laughs> I laugh as the train passes by. The corpse of the gallows. We smile as the cucumber is eaten. <laughs> Screaming isn't just planned. Moving, regurgitating, repulsing. Worms and Singing flower pot. The 
mother ate her child with her sticky and slimy mouth. After that, Joe can find the second part of Ivy's letter on the floor. I miss you. I do. I force myself to hate. Still there, deep in my soul, you live. And through my eyes, every day, you cry. Joe then meets Dr. Z in one of the rooms, who is trying to resuscitate a girl named Agnes. He then asks Joe to go fetch something for him from the basement, and that he'll know what it is when he sees it. Turns out it's a human brain. Down there he also finds poison, so Joe kills the first Sophie and gets her dress. Back to Dr. Z. He puts the brain inside the head of the person he's trying to resuscitate. It doesn't work immediately, so he walks away to check on the fuses of his Frankenstein machine. But when Joe is about to leave too, he hears... Hello? Where? What is... Hello? Joe gives her Sophie's dress to wear. Her name is Agnes, and she decides to tie along, and says she has a note for Joe, and that it was the only thing on her when she woke up. But before she can give it to him... Joe and Ivy are in bed and she reaches out for help with her ED, and Joe is very understanding. They then talk about getting a cat, his name, how he's gonna be. Then Joe's stuck in a coffin. He talks to the dead and learns that he's not dead yet, but there's nothing he can do about it. Just... When you're dead, all there is left is watching. And waiting, watching, and waiting, watching, and waiting. Agnes wakes up in a random room, someone violently banging on the door. She manages to escape with a makeshift rope, just as the X-Man strikes the door. She manages to escape the hotel grounds, only to end up in this strange bathroom place. Also Ivy's here. Agnes wants to get the hell out, but Ivy says that she won't let her out. Agnes convinces her to follow her to the exit regardless, which is a door that leads right to her house. Agnes escapes, but the door slams shut behind her as soon as she passes through it, leaving Ivy behind. She is now in the Queen of Maggots house, and in the back, there are several coffins. Agnes manages to pry one of them open, and she finds Joe in there, and they're quickly back in their quest to save Ivy. Joe catches her up with everything that happened before she woke up. In the fourth floor, they come across a room that holds Joe and Ivy's dream house, and inside, the last Sophie is hiding. He doesn't have the means to kill her yet, so they leave her alone, for now. Hey, 
Hey, I know this one. It's, uh... It's Coldplay, right? No. It's not Coldplay. But I'm sure I've heard it before. Keep playing. I've almost got it. You're pretty good, Joe. Nah, I haven't played in years. Anyway, that's enough. We don't want to spend all day fooling around. At the party on the third floor, they meet another Sophie, crying because her boyfriend Harrison said that she's fat and ugly, and that he must be right, and there will never be anyone like him. Joe gets the keys to his room on the second floor and there he finds 10 pounds, tape and a note telling him to blind this painting here. He gets cigarettes from this machine here and then heads upstairs to blind the painting, opening the secret passage up. In there, Joe finds Dr. Z's corpse and the final part of Ivy's letter. I miss you. How much? Still less than I should. Never there, but somehow with me. You breathe. You love only me. Me, myself. No one. Giving a cigarette to Harrison after turning the stove in the bathroom on, Joe manages to kill him and one of the Sophies, along with demolishing the back wall. Inside that room, there's a recipe for an... interesting smoothie. Joe makes the recipe and gives it to the crying Sophie, killing her. Now there's only one left. Walking out of the room, the manager is waiting for Joe, asking him to go meet her in her office. He obliges and she reveals that she's Joe's perfect ideal of a woman, and tells him to stop denying it and to follow her to a special place, so she can give him a perfect weapon. Joe does need something to kill the final Sophie with so he bites. On the way there, turns out that Agnes is Ivy and that the X-Men is Joe. Okay. The manager tries to pitch Joe against Agnes, showing him the real her and that he has to kill the monster. Joe obviously doesn't believe her and kills the manager instead. Joe is bloodthirsty now, so he heads to the dream house to kill the last Sophie, all the while she is running away from him, ending up back at Ellen Road. While Joe is busy doing that, Susan goes to investigate what's all that noise in the middle of the night. If you're not aware, Susan is the protagonist from The Cat Lady. Basically, she tries to do herself in, but the Queen of Maggots says I'll need you to go back and face five people. They're not ordinary people, they're very special, just like you, only in a slightly different way. Just abominable people that need to go. And while she hasn't completed the task, she can't really die. Joe finally kills the last Sophie and reaches the place behind the mirror, but it's too late. Ivy's already dead. He refuses to give up though, carrying her to the Frankenstein machine that's now in Ellen Road, trying to shock some life into her. It doesn't work, but then Agnes shows up, and they have the realization that she's the good part of Ivy, the person who Joe fell in love with. They try again, and this time... C. 
sorry, neighbor, but I happen to have a zero tolerance for sons of bitches. Don't worry though, he's alive and Ivy attacks her and the two escape, burning down the road building in the process. Are we good? We're good. The end. So, you might be thinking, Liv, what's the big deal? It's just a story about two broken people coming together and actually managing to work things out because of the power of love. Why are you making this video? Well... Especially since I haven't done anything I you to deserve this. I can you see that you finally have lost your damn mind. You're acting like okay. a fucking psycho. Here I've had go. enough of this. I stop it you right had now. Fun playing oh, psycho bitch not that bad again. Woman. This is the real Joe Davis. So here's the thing, people usually don't like to intentionally do bad things. <laughs> you don't want to choose the rude options in games. You want everything to turn out fine and everyone to live happily ever after. But the thing that goes over people's heads is that Downfall doesn't have a self-insert protagonist. Even while playing the good route, there are clues about Joe's actual personality and past mistakes all over. When he mentions that we had a black cat once, I told Ivy I buried him in the park, she'll never know. And later Susan finds the charred remains of a cat in the oven. When he refuses to give the injection to Sophie. No, I don't want your blood on my hands. But Joe. You are already covered in it, from head to toes. The chair chained to the floor with rotting food on the table in the flat. People telling Joe over and over again that it's impossible to save Ivy. Of course it's impossible. Just like it's almost impossible for an abuser to look at themselves in the mirror and realize what they are and change for the better. He is a parasite. But you're most likely not a parasite. You want to save Ivy, you want to help her, and since her problems are at the forefront of the game and so much flashier than Joe's character, which reminds me that that's often the case with EDs, people are way too focused on the external and ignore the root of the problem. And you are not Joe, these clues go unnoticed until a second, third, or maybe you've even played through the game four times over and still didn't notice. Most people didn't even get the bad ending, judging by the percentage of the achievements on Steam. But the game has multiple endings, I hear you say. Well, yes, but here's the thing. This isn't the only game where Joe Davis appears. While replaying the cat lady for this video, I was surprised at how many Joe scenes there are. I think we can all agree that neither Joe nor Susan are particularly reliable narrators, but Susan is by far the better of the two. With a few exceptions, she can clearly differentiate between her dream sequences and her reality, while Joe... not so much. In my opinion, the only events depicted in Downfall that actually happened were the prologue, the pillow talk scene, and the ending in Ellen Road. Even though Joe only appears in dream sequences in The Cat Lady, we get a tour of his flat and it is wrecked. 
We can also find a letter which mentions that Joe didn't show up to his psychiatrist's appointment the last few weeks. His lock is weirdly sophisticated. Susan mentions that... Well, the man is called Joe Davis. He seems nice. Quiet type. But I heard him shouting a couple of times, and he sounded almost like a different person. Like a madman, you know? Among other things that I'll mention later, but keep it all in mind. The golden ending is literally called the impossible, and the bad ending is called the sixth parasite, and the achievement you get for it is called downfall, which, hello, is the title of the game. Also, I always thought it was weird that Joe gets all this build up in the cat lady, but isn't one of the parasites. Meanwhile, that guy with the flowers just shows up. Maybe he was meant to be one of the parasites, but it turned into something much bigger. So let's go through the game again, but this time with the real Joe Davis. The game starts with a prologue, which is set when the characters were all kids. The main character, Joe, is talking to his brother, Robbie. Robbie heard someone he thinks is a gangster talk about something hidden in the construction site nearby, and he's gonna look for it. Joe says, Yeah, right. Good luck with that. And they go their separate ways. Soon, Joe sees a girl sitting in front of a diner, and they start talking. Her name is Ivy, she's from Sweden, she likes cats and red flowers, she's on a diet and hates her dad who left them. Joe tells her that he knows the place where cats go to die, and that there are a bunch of red flowers nearby, and he takes her to see them. After that, they see an ice cream truck and run after it. Joe orders his ice cream and asks Ivy what does she want. She tells him that she doesn't want anything, but he decides to order for her. She'll have chocolate. Girls love chocolate. I said no, and no means no. go after her, dude. What's wrong with you? I said no, didn't I? They quickly make up as all kids do, and then Robbie shows up, saying that he found the money and needs Joe's help. They all go to the construction site, and Joe pries a concrete slab open, but it's not money they find in there. Oh, shit. What is it? Step away, both of you. It's grenades. A great bowl of freaking grenades. Ivy and Joe back off to call the police, but Robbie stays back. He says that it's not money, but the grenades must be worth something, right? He could sell them. He picks one up, and then... Do you think we can... Yeah. Then it cuts to grown-up Joe's voiceover. He says that they met again when they were in their 20s. He doesn't think Ivy remembered him, or at least she didn't mention anything, and neither did he. Him and Ivy fell in love and got married within a few months, but then... Then our luck ran out, and the cracks started to show. But I knew how to fix it. His solution is a quick holiday, 
but things aren't great because as soon as they get there, she starts giving him the silent treatment. He follows her to the dining room and... Devil came through here. Hey, you got your voice back. Are we okay now? Can we go back to that room? We are not alone, Joe. They are watching us. Who? These bad people. They live in the mirrors. They reach out sometimes, trying to grab. They've gone now, but soon they will return. I knew you'd ruin it. You always ruin everything. Really? I'm just trying to warn you. Warn me from what? Bad things have happened here. Can you really not see them? Yeah. Sure. I can see. I can see that you finally lost your damn mind. They'll devour you whole, Joe. They... they will. No! Get away from him! I... have gone now. Who's gone? I don't understand. The big, fat, flesh-eating maggots with blood pouring out of their hungry mouth. They are always hungry, and they will bite and chew and swallow until we are nothing. You're acting like a fucking psycho. I've had enough of this. Stop it right now. Ivy clearly needs serious help and Joe is only making it worse with his constant berating her. They get a room and continue arguing and Ivy tells him I think it's time to say it loud and clear. Ivy. I'm serious. This stupid holiday. It's never gonna fix anything. It's too late for that. So please, say it Joe. Say it. So we can both be free. Fine. I'll say it. We're finished. Ivy leaves and Joe falls asleep. Trippy dreams ensues, but was it really a dream? Joe still has the 10 pound bill he picked up in it. Joe tries to find Ivy, but when he walks into the dining room to see if she's having breakfast, he finds... this. Apparently, Ivy's with Sophie, the person staying in the room next to theirs, and she doesn't want Joe to look for her. The manager leaves a key for room 102 on the front desk for Joe anyway. After some puzzle solving, Joe finally confronts Sophie. She says that Ivy's hiding behind a mirror and that he has to kill four memories of Sophie and that she herself is the first one. Only then he'll be able to reach Ivy. After that, the elevator starts working again. On the second floor, Joe has an uncomfortable conversation with the managers. Are you coming on to me? Maybe. Don't. You're playing hard to get, but I know deep inside, you're burning with desire. Joe then meets Dr. Z in one of the rooms, who is trying to resuscitate a girl named Agnes. He then asks Joe to go fetch something for him from the basement, and that he'll know what it is when he finds it. Turns out it's a human brain. Down there he also finds poison, so Joe kills the first Sophie and gets her dress. Back to Dr. Z, he puts the brain inside the head of the person he's trying to resuscitate. It doesn't work immediately, so he walks away to check on the fuses of his Frankenstein machine. But when Joe is about to leave too, he hears... Hello? Where? What is... Hello? 
Joe gives her Sophie's dress to wear. Her name is Agnes and she decides to tag along and says that she has an oath for Joe and that it was the only thing on her when she woke up. But before she can give it to him... Agnes? We've got a problem. Joe and Ivy are in bed and she tried mentioning that she has been struggling with her ED again, but Joe simply shuts her down. Oh, not that shit again. Yeah, I knew you'd say that, but you're right. It's stupid. Just forget I'd said anything. No, it's me being stupid. I'm sorry. Don't be. It's not your fault. It's my own fucked up brain that's doing it. And I can't stop it. I see. It's a self-conscious, I look too fat business. Again. I thought you got over that. Then, Joe's stuck in a coffin. He talks to the dead and learns that he's not dead. Yet. But there's nothing he can do. Just... It all just doesn't matter when you're dead. All there is left is watching and waiting. Watching and waiting. Watching and waiting. Next, Agnes wakes up in a random room, someone violently banging on the door. She manages to escape with a makeshift rope, just as the X-Men strikes the door. She manages to escape the hotel grounds, only to end up in this strange bathroom place. Also, Ivy is here. Agnes wants to get the hell out, but Ivy says that she won't let her out. Agnes convinces her to tell her where the exit is, which is a door that leads right to her house. Agnes escapes and the door slams shut behind her as soon as she passes through it. She is now in the Queen of Maggots house and in the back there are several coffins and candles. The Queen had asked Agnes to... Would you kindly blow out one of the candles in the next room? What? Why? It's just a little tradition in my house. I ask all my guests to do that. And Agnes obliges. Anyways, Agnes manages to pry one of the coffins open and she finds Joe in there and they're quickly back in their quest to save Ivy. Joe catches her up with everything that happened before she woke up. In the fourth floor, they come across a room that holds Joe and Ivy's dream house and inside, the last Sophie is hiding. He doesn't have the means to kill her yet, so they leave her alone for now. At the party on the third floor, they meet another Sophie, crying because her boyfriend, Harrison, said that she's fat and ugly, and that he must be right and there will never be anyone like him. Joe manages to get the keys to Harrison's room on the second floor after this nice chat with him. Just stay away from the birthday girl. She's a fucking nutcase, she is. Why? She's madly in love with me. And how's that a bad thing? Oh, man. That girl's ass is the size of a football stadium. Stupid fat bitch. I don't think I can do it without getting super wasted. If 
few more beers and I'm sure it won't matter. And there he finds another 10 pounds. Giving a cigarette to Harrison after turning the stove in the bathroom on, Joe manages to kill him and one of the sophies, along with demolishing the back wall. Inside the secret room, there's a recipe for an interesting smoothie. Joe makes the recipe and gives it to the crying Sophie, killing her. Now there's only one left. Walking out of the room, the manager is waiting for Joe, asking him to go meet her in her office. He obliges and she reveals that she's Joe's perfect ideal of a woman and tells him to stop denying it and to follow her to a special place so she can give him a perfect weapon. It's time you've told me who you really are. You know very well who I am. I am your secret little desire, Joe. Your perfect woman. I'm never bitter or tired or not in the mood. Instead, I'm composed and strong and spontaneous. I don't burden you with my baggage of problems. I don't poison your life. I don't hide from you. Now is the perfect time for us to reconcile. To forget about that little bitch, Ivy. To run away and be happy. What do you say, Joe? Yes. Joe is overcome with desire, so he bites. On the way there, turns out that Agnes is Ivy, and that the X-Men is Joe. You're beautiful. Am I? <laughs> Stop it, Joe, you'll make me blush. The manageress pitches Joe against Agnes, showing him the real her and that he has to kill the monster. And so, he does. Joe is bloodthirsty now and he heads to the dream house to kill the last Sophie. All the while, she's running away from him, ending up back at Ellen Road. While Joe's busy doing that, Susan goes to investigate what's all that noise in the middle of the night. In Joe and Ivy's flat, Susan sees chairs chained to the floor, heaps of rotting food, smashed TV, the place is a mess. Joe finally kills the last Sophie and reaches the place behind the mirror. But it's too late, Ivy's already dead. He refuses to give up though, carrying her to the Frankenstein machine that's now in Ellen Road, trying to, trying to shock some life into her. It doesn't work. Naive little fool. You are the sixth parasite. And the sixth changes everything. I have no idea what you are talking about, you crazy woman. And then Agnes shows up, or what's left of her. Joe realizes, way too late, that she's a good part of Ivy, the person who Joe fell in love with. They try again, and this time... Still breathing, eh? You are one tough son of a bitch, Joe. But I've got bad news, neighbor. This crazy cat lady knows how to deal with nasty parasites like you. Oh, I'll get the devil out of you, Joe Davis. They both burn to ashes. The end. Joe doesn't care for Ivy, 
He only cares about what he can get, what he can take for himself. He wants things his way or the highway, and just wants to smash things into his version of perfection again. Yes, he does try to help Ivy, but never once does he ask what she needs. Like everything revolves around him and should abide by his logic and his rules. He doesn't see her as a person, only as a thing that he owns and isn't behaving the way it's supposed to. Remember everything I mentioned previously? Joe's fragile mental state, the wrecked flat, rotting food on the table, the chair chained to the ground, the weirdly sophisticated lock, and something else that I said I'd mention later. In the dream in which Susan is transported to, Ivy is Hello? screaming. Misery. I is that what you said? And there's a bookshelf stacked with Stephen King novels. In there, Susan finds misery, which, in case you don't know, in very broad strokes, it's about keeping someone captive. In a savior complex trance, Joe is trying to save Ivy, not for her sake, but for his. And in that chase, he killed the good part of her. But, well, I guess a godlike figure controlling your every word and action is just what is needed to fix someone like that. So yeah, thank you so much for watching this video, I really love these games and this idea has been floating around in my brain for a while, also known as years. I actually don't know if this is a hot take or not. I took a long time to realize this. As I used as an example, I only started putting the pieces together on my fourth playthrough. And I always see people focusing more on the depression and ED aspect of the game. <laughs> so I wanted to talk about it. <coughs> um, yeah? Aren't you forgetting something? Uh, oh, yeah, 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 thanks. Don't mention it. Why in the downfall ending? Is Susan encouraging people to do it? Well, I don't know. Just honestly, I don't know. No matter what ending you get in the Cat Lady, it includes the same passage. It turned out there were others who felt like I did. I talked to them, tried to help. So, it also doesn't make a lick of sense that, I don't know, the regular ending is canon and that Ivy was the actual parasite? Like, what? <laughs> I think that the best explanation I can find is that the downfall ending takes place right after Mitz's death, considering that she doesn't show up in the sixth parasite ending and that Susan was going through a rough patch because of that. And by the way, the background music I'm using in this video is storytelling from the Cat Lady soundtrack. So yeah, go check it out. All these games, um, all the soundtracks are amazing, like please, if you missed it, I can't recommend this enough. Thank you. Okay, yeah, so now I'm done. Like and subscribe and blah 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 blah. And I'll make more videos if an anvil doesn't fall on my head. Bye!